Hey guys, so if you're hearing this recording, it's because my family and I, because of the snow load, are either stranded in South Dakota, or we have canceled youth group altogether. Uh, but because I'm trying to make my way through a series, I am doing this youth group presentation by recording, by video, and uh, I hope that works for everybody. And uh, by the time we all get back to youth group together, probably going to seem like ancient history since we were together last. But uh, being that technology offers us this opportunity, I'm happy to at least be able to bring a message to you this way uh, for tonight. Um, you'll also have to forgive my voice. I'm dealing with a something. I don't know what, but I can probably sound more like a some kind of frog than human being. But if you'll bear with that, then uh, I am uh, I'm ready to look into the Word of God uh, with you guys tonight through the song joy to the world. Here's how it goes. Joy to the world. The Lord is come. Let earth receive her king. Let every heart prepare him room and heaven and nature sing. Now, this ultra familiar hymn was first published in the year 1719. It was written by Isaac Watts. Isaac Watts was an English minister and a revolutionary hymn writer. Prior to the life and ministry of Isaac Watts, churches only sang songs that were taken directly out of the book of Psalms and the Bible, and churches would not allow other, newer, or individual expressions of worship to God in a congregational setting like our youth group. They just wouldn't let people do that, sing other kinds of songs. Now, it's always a total and major plus to sing corporate worship songs together that include as much scripture in them as possible. But the fact that anything else that's true about God uh, can be included in our worship songs that's not explicitly taken from the book of Psalms is because of Isaac Watts and the hymns he pioneered for the church totaling over uh, 750, many of which are still sung today and are very familiar even perhaps to several of you, and they include, Alas, and did my Savior bleed. If you know the song, it goes like this. Alas, and did my Savior bleed, and did my Sovereign die? Would he devote that sacred head? For such a worm as I. He also wrote, O oh God, our help in ages past, our hope for years to come, our shelter in the stormy blast, and our eternal home. And when I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, my richest gain I count but loss, and pour contempt on all my pride. And of course, Joy to the World, which, by the way, wasn't one of those non-Psalm songs I was talking about. It's based entirely on Psalm 98. So in unpacking this song over the next several weeks, we're really studying, quite literally, Psalm 98. Anyways, Joy to the World is currently one of the most widely published Christian hymns in the entire world. And it actually has been for, for a couple centuries, and it's been included in over 1,400 hymn books that have been published in North America alone. The significance of Isaac Watts' contribution to the church is so pivotal that the Lutheran Church recognizes November 25th as a special day on its liturgical calendar in memory of and in honor of Isaac Watts. And so with that, I'm pleased to introduce tonight the Advent Holiday Series of Messages Unpacking for Our Hearts and Minds, the infamous and cherished carol, Joy to the World, which begins once again. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her king. Let every heart prepare him room and heaven and nature sing. Uh, before we go any further, uh, let's just begin with prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the words of great Christmas songs like Joy to the World, and last year how we looked into the song O Holy Night. Lord, you give us a vision, and uh, you give us such poetic and beautiful words to get to know you and your word more. Lord, I ask tonight, uh, and for whoever watches this, and whatever they watch it on, Lord, that the words from this song would just come deep into our hearts, that you would make everything that uh, would get in your way, Lord, that because of your beauty and your majesty and the reality of who you are and what you've done for us in Christ, that everything else would be counted as loss for the sake of knowing Jesus. And Lord, that this reality is spoken of very clearly in this song, and that as we continue to sing joy to the world every Christmas, Lord, we'd be reminded of, of exactly that, of who you are for us in Christ. Lord, I pray for every heart and every mind that hears this message. Be with us, Lord, as we learn in Jesus' name. Amen. Did you know 
that this is not a Christmas song. Joy to the World was not written about Christmas. It was written about the coming of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, of Him coming into this world in person from heaven. That's true. But Joy to the World is about the second coming of Jesus Christ. When He comes to judge the world, when He comes to resurrect His believers who've died and to be forever united to His church. So in singing Joy to the World, we're not singing about the first coming of Jesus' birth as a human baby at Christmas. So why do we sing this song at Christmas? I have no idea. I looked it up. I was looking online all over the place. Why do we sing this song at Christmas? And I couldn't find anything. It's just not there. But we sing this song at Christmas, and I'm glad that we do. Isaac Watts' aim in this song was to exalt the glory of Christ in his second coming to celebrate God's judgments over sin and God's bringing salvation for his people into its full consummation. But the song appropriately recognizes four particular calls to us as creatures made in God's image, four calls that were established for the church by Jesus Christ in his first coming. The calls in this song are namely, Let earth receive her king. Let every heart prepare him room. Let people use their voices and songs while heaven and nature itself sings, repeating the sounding joy. Let sin and sorrow cease, and for the blessings of God's salvation for us and restoration of us to spread everywhere the curse of sin currently has influence. And the song's final verse is this spectacular exaltation. He rules the world. Jesus Christ rules the world with truth and with grace and makes the nations prove the glories of his righteousness, and wonders of his love. We're going to get into all of these things over the next few weeks and hopefully see for ourselves that the first coming of Christ is the foundation for these majestic words of hope in the reality of Jesus Christ's second coming, even in all the ways we see the reality of his reign over all things today. And so as a a result of this study series, I hope we never sing joy to the world quite the same ever again. In joy to the world... The line we're unpacking tonight goes like this. Let every heart prepare him room. We don't have nearly enough time in this youth group session to unpack a line like this, but in the next 20 minutes or so, I'm totally going to try. The question I have for you tonight is, how much room does Jesus need? Again, the line in in the song goes, let every heart prepare him room. And so how are we doing on this one, guys? As we head into the Christmas season, how are you doing on this? Have you prepared room in your heart for Jesus? Well, that's not just a cliche children's Sunday school line. This is Isaac Watts talking. Are you prepared to receive your king? If the president of the United States were coming to your home and for some reason was going to make it his base of operations for a while, how much room in your home would you set aside for someone like the president of the United States? You just give him the shed? Or maybe you'd give him that spare room in the back? Or would you devote the whole house to be used however the president saw fit to use it? And honestly, who's the president of the United States in comparison to Jesus Christ? And how much room in our hearts are we talking about here? So first, before anything else, let's be reminded of at least one reason why there might not be room in our hearts. We're going to go to Jesus in Luke 13. and He says this, No servant can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Now, in 21st century United States especially, it's pretty obvious that we have a societal complex about finances and goods, about food, clothes, cars, phones, and homes. Money, you know, can't serve God and money. Money in this verse doesn't necessarily mean dollars and cents. Jesus is talking about the things of this world, about provision, about prosperity. First John calls it the cravings of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. God promises us fullness of joy and pleasures forevermore in his presence. But when he calls us to devote ourselves completely to him and to abandon the pursuit of money, of provision and prosperity, our hearts don't expect only fullness of joy and pleasures forevermore as a result of that. 
You know, we think fullness of joy and pleasures forevermore come from fulfilling our cravings. We think that pleasures forevermore comes from gratifying our lusts and from all that we own and from all the things that we're capable of. We think fullness of joy and pleasures forevermore in some way, shape, or form comes from money or comes from this world's provisions and prosperity. And so we really do devote ourselves to that and not God, don't we? But believe it or not, uh, giving our hearts totally to God does not automatically mean poverty or misery. In fact, there are people in the Bible that God deliberately raised up to be very wealthy people. So much so, in fact, that in the time that Solomon was king of Israel, gold and silver became as common as stone. Imagine that, that gold or silver became as common as just a rock you'd pick up off the ground. That's how wealthy all of Israel became. But here's the thing. If you read the account out of Second Chronicles, God told Solomon to ask him for whatever he wanted, and God would give it to him. Can you imagine? Solomon could have asked for power and influence, like, like military power. He could have asked for riches, lands, prosperity of every kind, of any kind. He could ask for anything, even to be the ruler of the entire world. And what Solomon asked God for was wisdom. He asked God for wisdom. And we kind of think we know what wisdom means. That wisdom means smart. Wisdom means cunning or shrewd. Was Solomon uh, really just asking God to make him more intelligent? Like, just make him smarter? No, of course not. In Romans 12, the Apostle Paul exhorts us to be transformed, to become something that's eternal and not doomed to the fate of this world, to do this by renewing our minds so that by testing we'll be able to know God's good and perfect will. 1 Corinthians 2 teaches us that the mind we're born with uh, thinks only about worldly things, but that God, through his Spirit, gives us the very mind of Christ, tuning our very thoughts to God's own thoughts. Likewise, Solomon was asking God for a renewed mind from God, the kind of mind that comes from God. Solomon was, in fact, asking God for the very mind of God so that he would know God and intimately understand God's will, to know God within his own being. In other words, let every heart prepare him room, just like Solomon. Solomon is an awesome example of what this line in the Christmas song means. When given the chance to have anything, anything at all that he wanted and desired, Solomon wanted his life to be filled with the knowledge of God. And this is something that God never holds back in giving uh, to those who truly want it. And of all the things Solomon valued, God himself was all that really mattered. Solomon wanted his heart, he wanted his mind, and he wanted his life to be filled with the things of God. And so it was. And because of Solomon, we have the book of Proverbs in the Bible, along with Ecclesiastes. We have several Psalms and the Song of Songs. Also, it just so happened that Solomon became vastly wealthy, and he became world famous as a result of being filled with the wisdom of God. Now, not everyone is going to become wealthy beyond wealthy because their life is filled with God. You're never going to hear me say that a life filled with the things of God means you'll have a healthy, wealthy life. It might not. Probably not. All those things. That's up to God. But the difference between happening to have wealth, like on a worldwide scale throughout all time, all of us in America have fabulous wealth. But the difference between happening to have wealth and serving wealth has more to do with what you get excited about living for. Is hope of wealth or hope of power or romance or reputation, is that what you get excited about? Maybe those are the sort of things that you get really excited about or really anxious about that keep you awake at night and keep you thinking and daydreaming about. Or are you excited about the things of God? Could you be excited about devoting your life to Christ regardless of of how life goes because of it? Let every heart prepare him room. How much room? What do you think is an appropriate amount of attention to give to the things of God? Right? What do you think Solomon would say? What do you think Jesus would say? Well, let's find out what Jesus would say. This is Jesus, Matthew six twenty-five through 33 from his famous Sermon on the Mount. He says, Therefore I tell you, 
Do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you'll drink, nor about your body, what you'll put on. Is not life more than food, and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap, nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin, yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is alive, and tomorrow's thrown in the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Let every heart prepare him room. Versus what, right? Let every heart prepare Jesus' room instead of what? Everything. Everything. Even necessary things. For Jesus to be first in our lives, guys, will not leave us miserable or impoverished in other ways. It's only after Jesus is first in our lives that everything else has its good and proper place and functions for us in God-honoring ways. Otherwise, all these things that are added on to us, and when he says, seek first the kingdom of God, and then all these other things will be added on to us. If, if Jesus isn't first in our lives, then all these things that are added on to us, all these things that God gives us as gifts to delight us and to take care of us, all those things become idols. They literally become gods. Listen to Jesus again in Revelation three fifteen through 20. I know your works. You are neither cold nor hot. Would that you were either cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spit you out of my mouth. For you say, I am rich, I have prospered, and I need nothing. Not realizing that you're wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich and white garments so that you may clothe yourself and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen and salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. Those whom I love I reprove and I discipline so be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. So Jesus knocks at our heart, right? If we hear him, and if our hearts welcome him, he'll come into our hearts and he'll come into our lives. For example, let every heart prepare him room. So how much room are we talking about here? Because if let every heart prepare him room means that he comes into our heart and we experience community with Jesus, how much of our heart and our life gets affected by all of that? Is this just another one of those cutesy kids Sunday school verses? No, it's not. This is a total throwdown. The picture on the screen looks really gentle. It looks really sweet. But the truth is, Jesus is taking our sinful cravings and lusts head on. This is a throwdown, man. If he doesn't do that, he's just going to vomit us all back up. And so when we say, let every heart prepare him room, what are we really talking about here? Like, leave room for a Bible on top of a dusty shelf? Like, leave room in our life to spend an hour or two at, at church every week? Let every heart prepare him room, like, leave enough room in our iPod playlist for Christian music? Leave room in our schedule to celebrate two or three holidays every year? Well, what about entertainment? You ever think about entertainment? Like, should our hearts make room for Jesus in the way that we amuse ourselves? Should Jesus have anything to do with the things we watch on TV, that we watch online or, or watch on our smartphones? How much should Jesus have to do with that? What do you think? How about relationships? Honestly, how much room should we make for Jesus to have in our romantic relationships? How concerned are you about whether the person you'll marry someday knows and loves the Lord? Now, a lot of so-called Christians think romantic love for themselves is more important than making sure Jesus has anything to do with it. Right? You know, guys, I'm going to say that again. 
that a lot of so-called Christians think romantic love for themselves is more important than making sure Jesus has anything to do with it. That in romance, there is no room for Jesus. My love life is no place for Jesus, and it's no place for his rules or his recommendations. Or for Solomon's recommendations, for that matter. Guys, listen to what Solomon says about romantic pursuits. Uh, Proverbs 31.10 An excellent wife who can find. She is far more precious than jewels. It's very interesting, you know. The only other thing the Bible ever says to be more precious than jewels is wisdom. Solomon, again, in, in Proverbs 3. So how much room is there for wisdom, for the mind of Christ himself in your hope for romance? Right? Let every heart prepare him room. How much room? How much? The truth is, we all have things in our life that we tend to section off from Jesus when we think we're opening our hearts to him. When we come to church or we come to youth group and we sing these songs and we, we bow our heads for prayer and we think we've opened up our hearts to make room for Jesus, we prepare some room for him maybe. Maybe the shed or maybe our heart's storage room. He's there for us, you know, just in case things go awry. You know, Jesus, take the wheel. Or... We leave enough room for him, like we, we give him the spare room in the back corner of our heart that we don't have any other categories for, right? That room isn't really for anything else. It's like, like for religion. I mean, what's that? It doesn't have anything to do with the rest of our lives. Religion doesn't really have anything to do with our real lives. It's just this meaningless spare thing I, I better keep around because of whatever. And so, so there's a room in my heart for that. It's like there's a room in, in your house for just a bunch of junk. In reality, God is infinite and he's eternal. And the Bible says that God is a consuming fire. And he gave Jesus Christ to the church, which is his body. Literally, we who love Jesus are the fullness of him. We're the fullness of God in Christ who fills all in all, according to Ephesians 2. Can you imagine devoting 100% of your life to the things of God and specifically to the church? Well, the church is the fullness of of him who fills all in all. Let every heart prepare him room. How much room are we talking about? What is an appropriate amount of room in our hearts and lives to set aside and to devote to the things of God, to devote to his church and to devote to his kingdom, and in all these things to Christ himself, who for the joy of bringing us into his glorious presence forever, in the greatest expression of love ever, left his place in heaven and took our place in the judgment of God over sin, and he died. Believe me, God himself prepared all the room in his heart for every single one of us when he left heaven to take our blame for sin and die on a cross. And then he rose from the dead so that we might be united to him in his death, but also to be united to his resurrected life and to live in the light of his glorious presence both now and forever. God has prepared all the room in his heart for us. So let me ask one last time, how much room in our hearts should we want such a God to have? We all already know, don't we? All of it. We should want God to have all of it. But honestly, we either want God to have it all or none at all. If we want God for any good we get from God other than God, then we're still serving two masters. And even hoping that God serves money too. The cravings of the flesh, the lust of our eyes. We hope that God serves our provision and our prosperity too. And that he'll help us out with stuff like that here and there. When we pray for stuff, that's the stuff we're praying about. If we're honest with ourselves, and for most of the world's people throughout all time, cravings, lust, provision, and prosperity, that's all that we want God for. Otherwise, we usually treat God as if he's of no other use at all to us. But if what you want really is God, then God will give you God. He'll fill your life with his spirit and even give you his own mind. And when you have God, you not only get 100% of what God knows is good for you, but you'll eventually get 100% of all there is. Jesus said in Luke 12 that it's God's good pleasure to give us his kingdom, that he's happy to give it to us in all the ways that he's given it to Christ. 
all that there really is for our hearts, guys, is fully found in God and only through his son, Jesus Christ. If it's God you want, then prepare him room. Lay aside every weight and sin that clings so closely. Count everything as loss for the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus our Lord. Psalm 1611, you make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. So, joy to the world. The Lord is come. Let earth receive her king. Let every heart prepare him room. And heaven and nature sing. Let's close in prayer. O holy child of Bethlehem, descend to us, we pray. Cast out our sin and enter in. Be born in us today. Well, we hear the Christmas angels in songs like Joy to the World. Hark the herald angels sing, O holy night. We hear the Christmas angels, the great glad tidings tell. Jesus, come to us and abide with us. Our Lord, Emmanuel. Amen.